Hi, this is Lucio, and welcome back to Echo. Things in the last episode got pretty bad. We're kind of like kidnapped um, or something, and we're underground or somewhere. So we're stuck here, and we don't know what we're doing. So we're going to keep exploring, and hopefully something's going to turn up. What can get us out of here or try and make sense of the situation as to what is going on? Immediately it's clear that wherever we are isn't very large. Four identical hallways lead us around in a perfect square. Each hallway has three doors on the right, one on the left, and a hatch in the ceiling that leads to the attic. What also becomes immediately clear is that the door on the left leads into the kitchen, but from the kitchen there's only one door out. Each time we open the door to the kitchen we come to realise that the angle in which we enter it is the same. The first time this happens we're mostly just confused, wondering if maybe we backtrack somehow. After the second time though, Raven laughs. This isn't real! Are we on drugs or something? But we're all seeing the same thing. Or I'm just having this dream and none of you are real. The husky's voice is bordering on crazy. That paired with his grin, paired with him holding a knife is slightly disconcerting. Cole huffs, hitching me up higher on his shoulders. Okay, calm down. Just don't think about it. Let's try the other doors. I'm a little surprised at how well Cole is taking all of this. I wonder if part of it has to do with any of the weed that might still be in his system. We start trying the doors on the right, and this time things are different. The first door opens up to a wall, just an extension of the beige colour of the wall surrounding it. We stare at it for a few moments, and for the first time I get a deep, unsettling terror in the pit of my stomach. I manage to keep it from rising to the surface, but all of this bizarre imagery combined with the surreal haze is making me feel sick and claustrophobic. Bummer, that's definitely not the way out. On to the next door. Carl chuckles again, and I feel myself clinging to his attempt at humour just to keep myself sane. We are stuck in a bad way. The next door opens up to what looks like a bathroom. It's definitely not a modern one though, since it's complete with a pool chain from a high tank. Well, at least we got the essentials, right? The next door reveals a room full of tools and chains hanging from the ceiling, along with a sawhorse. The walls, though, are lined with wooden planks, and Cole gently sets me against the hallway wall before hurrying in and peering at the wood. Yeah, we've hurt our legs, so we need to be helped around a bit. Fuck, it's just concrete behind this. I don't bother to ask what the hell's going on again. I'm just starting to accept that where we are can't be explained. More doors are opened, 12 in all. One is completely white and empty. Another contains a frilly bedroom, which is where Cole says he woke up. Further along, we come across what looks like an office, along with a room decorated with sofas and a chandelier. When we reach one of the doors in the last hall though, something's different. The first thing I notice is the smell. Though it's faint, I can tell it's sweet in the most disgusting way possible. What is that? Raven holds a hand up to his nose as we approach the second to last door in the last hall. This one is clearly damaged, the wood is splintered in the middle, bulging out slightly, as if it's been punched from the other side. We all stare at it for a moment, the smell growing stronger. And then it hits me. Oh god, do you think? I can't finish, covering my muscle with both hands. Raven, who'd been right up next to the door, steps back with an arm up around his face, looking like he's about to throw up. I imagine the smell is a lot worse for him. M maybe we should skip this one for now. Carl hesitates then gently sets me down against the wall again. We need to check every door, this could be the way out, you know? He looks back at me, but I don't say anything, just grimacing at the door. He holds out a hand to Raven. Knife. After handing it over, Raven takes several more steps back further up the hall. I press my hands to my muzzle, readying myself to shut my eyes. As Carl turns the knob, I grip my teeth. This room has no illumination, Therefore, we have to rely on the light from the hallway to see inside. As the light from the opening door spreads across the room, I see that it's rather simple. The walls are concrete, peppered with craters and rocks. The floor's smoother, but with webs of cracks in the surface. I can't see the ceiling, but I do see what's hanging from it. Once the door opens completely, there's enough light to fully take in exactly what it is. A noose. Frayed and old-looking, but unmistakably a noose. Carl stares at it then sticks his head in further to look back and forth before stepping back to close the door. What was it? Raven calls up from the hall, his hands clasped nervously together. I noticed then that the rotting smell is completely gone now, instead of getting stronger when Carl opened the door. Nothing. Empty room. 
I see Carl visibly trying to keep his breathing under control as he holds the knife out to Raven before bending down in front of me again. Really? Oh, thank God. Carl trembles as he stands up with me in tow. As the husky moves on to the final door, I lean in next to Carl's cheek. You okay? Did you see anything? He turns his head toward mine, touching his cheek to mine. Aside from the rope? No. It's hard to say whether or not I believe him, or if he's just trying to protect me from whatever else he saw in there. Either way, I don't press for it. The last door is locked. It's big and made of small logs. Its deep brown colour contrasts with all the others. Raven jiggles the handle a few times and Cole tries to look into the cracks between the logs, but it's complete black. So that's it? That's all the doors? I'm starting to feel a certain level of panic again, now that we know that we're stuck. Carl, I think, picks up on that and comes over to where I'm leaning against the wall to set a hand on my shoulder. It's alright, man. We haven't checked the attic either. I mean, there aren't any windows, so like you said, we're probably in a basement or something, right? The reassuring hand feels good, but it's not exactly enough to keep me from feeling a certain level of despair. Honestly, I think I'm still dreaming right now. Carl doesn't say anything to that. Raven sidles up next to us. Well, dream or not, I'm still pretty hungry. We both glance at Raven, and I can't help but give a little laugh at the grin on his face. I guess, at least for now, it's best to just not think about it. We head back to the kitchen, which doesn't take very long because every door on the left leads to it. We all split up to search the many cupboards and drawers of the kitchen for food. We come up mostly empty, only finding silverware and cooking utensils here and there. Because of my injury, I cover a lot less ground, only able to hobble around along the counter using it as a crutch as I move down the line of cupboards. Even if we were able to find any food, there's no way I'd be able to cook it. The only thing I've ever been able to make on my own was a grilled cheese sandwich back when I was in high school. Even then, I'd almost burned down the house when I dropped a piece of bread on the gas stove. In a panic, I threw the flaming bread across the kitchen into the living room. I spied at the memory as I opened the last cupboard along the wall, and right in front of me is a block of cheese on a glass plate. Next to it is a loaf of bread in plastic bagging, and a small square of butter wrapped in wax paper. I stare at it for a moment, waiting for the food in front of me to disappear. I even blink a few times to be sure. Uh, guys? Sup? You seeing this? What? Cheese? Bread? Butter? I stand to the side and Raven perks up. Oh, you found food! I swear I already checked that cupboard. Raven's next to me a few seconds later, reaching in to take out the food. For a moment, I swear the bread blurs, as he pulls it out and I have to shut my eyes for a moment to keep from feeling sick. I feel Carl support me from behind, with his hands on my shoulders. Oh dude, you alright Chase? I grab onto the counter again. Yeah, it's just, uh... Carl waits for a moment. What? I just... I was thinking about grilled cheese before I opened the cupboard. Like, you just wanted a grilled cheese sandwich really badly and it popped up? Sort of. Ah. Oh. Carl walks up to the bread and bends over, observing it closely. Looks real. It is real. Raven walks up to the cupboard where he'd pulled the food from and closing it. Okay, I, I want a steak. He closes his eyes for a moment, then reaches out to pull the cupboard back open, smiling expectantly. It's empty. Well, grilled cheese isn't so bad. Raven moves down the counter to grab one of the pans hanging from the rack. Carl moves over to my side as Raven turns the gas stove on with a click 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 of the igniter. Dude, I think one of the important things to do right now is to stop questioning this place. We just can't make sense of it. I fold my arms. It has to be a dream. Carl puts an arm around me. Maybe, but dude, I'm just glad I'm not here alone. I nod in agreement. Yeah, I don't think I'd be able to deal with that. Let's just take it one step at a time for now, man. I manage a small smile. Are you high right now? Carl laughs. Man, I wish. I hear the sizzling of the melting butter as Raven plops it into the pan. Carl and I go about setting slices of cheese in the bread as Raven starts searing them. The action of making food is enough to calm me down at least a little, and the other two keeping high spirits lifts mine. Before long, there are six grilled cheese sandwiches stacked on the plate. They look good, but after the first bite, I almost let the food fall back out of my mouth. The fuck? I look over to see Carl and Raven, putting similar faces. Ugh, it kind of tastes like chalk. You know what chalk tastes like? 
Yeah, I ate some when I was a kid. He has a point. It's dry and crumbly, almost inedible. Well, it still sort of tastes like grilled cheese, sort of. I don't think this is food. It's not that bad. Besides, it's all we've got. Raven forces another bite, and so does Cole. I can't bring myself to do it. My ankle, the smoke, the dead body smell, and the noose. It's all too much for me to deal with right now. I watched Carl and Raven talk back and forth, and I'm again struck by how surreal this all feels. I think back to the time I first got stoned from a stupid pot muffin, how nothing felt real, how I felt like I wasn't in control. It's like that, only ten times worse. I wonder if the others feel the same. Something ebbs to the surface of my mind, trying to break through the veil of fog shrouding my mind. What are we doing? Why are we sitting here eating when we should be trying to figure out a way to get the fuck out? I open my mouth. Uh, ooh. Uh, every everything is fine. I struggle to keep my food down and instead choose to look hard at the tablecloth. You're not hungry. Raven is looking intently at my half-finished sandwich. Nah, you can have it. What was that? That thing that just invaded my mind. I slide my glass plate across the table to Raven. Carl watches me, but doesn't say anything, slowly chewing. I subconsciously note that he'd eaten around the crust, leaving those on the plate. We start discussing what else we might be able to do here, other possibilities on how we could get out. The attic is really the only place we haven't been to yet, but because it's so dark, we're not so sure about going. Well, why don't we sleep on it and figure out what to do when we wake up? Raven yawns widely. Ah, sounds good to me. It feels like it's been hours. It does feel that way, but without our phones, it's really impossible to tell. Leaving our plates where they were on the table, Raven leads us back out into the hallway. It takes us a few minutes to find the right door, considering everything looks identical, though we take special care to avoid the damaged door. As Raven moves into the bedroom, Cole leans against the wall, turning his head to talk back to me. Hey, we're gonna be alright, okay? I look back at the one green eye I can see, and will myself to squash the boiling pit of dread in my stomach. Okay, it's just that I can't believe this is happening, you know? I gotcha, I just want you to know I'll be here for you, okay? I look back at his gaze for a while, to the point where I think it's getting uncomfortable. I sigh. You guys are just acting really weird about all of this. Yeah? Well, I guess Raven's being Raven, but you're acting different. Really? How so? I swallow. Just yesterday you were throwing up over a job interview, and now you're the level-headed one while I'm freaking out. I laugh a little. I just don't understand what's going on is all. Carl sets me down against the wall, and then turns to me with a hug. Hey man, I don't know either. I'm just trying to keep it together too. The hug surprises me, but I take it gratefully. I stare over his shoulder at the uniform hallway. Despite Carl's efforts, the worrying feeling returns. Raven pokes his head around the doorway. Hey guys, that little sofa thing's awesome. I'll sleep there. You two can have the bed. Alright, nice. Gonna have a quick nap. And it is Sunday. I'm not gonna worry about the, the bloody knife. We'll move on from that. It is a new day. And, of course, I dream. I'm running through endless hallways. All kinds of hallways, including one that looks like a space station and another looks like a medieval castle. In each one, I run into locked doors. Because of this, I can only move through the halls, never knowing what's behind those doors. Eventually I wake up, but my dead limbs and heavy head tell me I'm not awake, not fully. I brace myself and shut my eyes again. My heart thumps and stomach churns with the disappointment of knowing that I'm still in that fucking bedroom. The one that tells me I'm still stuck in a nightmare that's beyond the one I'm currently in. I feel things move around the room, hear things that sound like whining, crying and screaming. Then I hear something in the ceiling moving above me. It has many legs like a spider that weighs hundreds of pounds. And then I'm free. I hold still as the gradual release of the paralysis seeps through my muscles and joints. At this point, I feel like I've mostly learned how to cope with the nightmares. That thought would make me happy if I wasn't so crushed that I'm still here in this actual nightmare. Immediately, anxiety rises back up in my chest as I realise how fucked up this actually is and how much sense this doesn't actually make. As far as I can tell, we've been drugged somehow and moved to this underground hellhole as an experiment of some kind. 
Someone in Echo had to have done this. One of the crazy old people. Maybe Duke? He probably built this underground maze just to watch us lose our minds, probably getting off to it at the same time. I grip the bedsheets and grip my teeth, grimacing at the ceiling as I try not to cry. That had to be it. This isn't some kind of supernatural alternate dimension. This is real, and someone's fucking with us. We're probably being watched by cameras that are set up in corners and peepholes right now. That idea sends a shiver down my spine, and I glance to my left, scanning the wall for any inconsistencies. We need to get out of here as soon as we can, and the sooner we start moving the better. I hear a small whining grunt to my left. At that moment, and I look over, I need to find that Cole isn't in the bed next to me. I stare for a moment at the tangled mess of sheets on the side of the bed, training off the side. Cole? Another grunt. And then I hear Cole, at least I think it's Cole. His voice is deep, raspy, and it sounds like he's trying on some sort of weird accent that I've never heard him use. My name... Soiled. Slowly I sit up, and that's when I see something white sitting next to the bed. Jesus. I jump and slide back on my ass away from it, almost falling off the other side of the bed. Staring at it a few seconds longer allows me to bake out the clear shape of horns under a bedsheet. Carl's sitting next to the bed with a white sheet over his head, swaying back and forth gently. What the fuck, Cole? I shout whispered to him, my earlier exclamation sounding way too loud in this quiet room. I look over at Raven, but somehow he's still curled up on the sofa fast asleep. Returning my attention to Cole, I jump again, as I see that he's staring right at me, or would be staring at me if there wasn't a sheet in the way. Cole, what are you doing? This isn't fucking funny at all. I push myself off the bed, leaning against it to take the weight off my swollen ankle, now to twice its original size, as I stand in front of Cole. I reach out to take the sheet off his head, but I hesitate. The horns? They look bigger than they should be, and the voice is so different. Dining, love. Cole. Cole, you're scaring the shit out of me? My voice is weak, and it cracks at the end as I lose my nerve. Had this place been getting to Cole more than he'd been letting on? But then maybe he was just sleepwalking? I remember him doing that when he stepped over at my house years ago. I reach out again more slowly this time, but again I hesitate. I can't shake the feeling that if I put it off, it won't be Cole. Suddenly, the horned head shakes back and forth violently, the grunting reaching a fever pitch. Shocked, I fall back on my rear, yelping as my ankle is jolted. I lean back on my hands, watching with wide eyes. The shaking is so wild that the sheet starts to slip off the head, as if whatever is under the sheet is trying to shake it off. I brace myself, watching as the sheet slides slowly from the horns to reveal... Cole. Of course it's Cole. He stares back at me with bleary eyes, like he'd just woken up. I swallow hard. Cole, what are you doing? He's silent for a moment, and finally speaks. I know what to do. What? Where are we supposed to be looking? Anywhere, but I know it's here. I lean uselessly against the dining room table again, watching them. I'm biting my lip, trying not to lose my core, trying to absorb everything Cole had just told me. You said James Hendricks himself came to you in your dream, right? Carl Halfsper doesn't look at me. Yep. And he told you that you had to find something? Carl gets down on his hands and knees and looks under the stove. I know it sounds stupid, but that's what happened. I frown. You know, I had a dream about a giant spider crawling through the ceiling, but uh... It doesn't mean that I'm going to be searching around for a spider in the ceiling? No, this was different. I never had a dream like this before. He stands back up and looks right at me. It felt like he was actually in my brain telling me. I look back at him for a while, not wanting to tell him that he's going crazy just like I am. Well, it's kind of vague to just tell you that you need to find something, isn't it? He told me other stuff. Cole moves closer to me, starting to look through the various decorum of the dining room. Like what? Cole lifts up a vase, looks inside. I said this place is chaos, a leftover memory from the old house. That still doesn't really make any sense. And that he organised it for us, into separate sections, to help us figure this out and clear his name, so that we can get out of here. How is clearing James Hendrix's name going to end this? I throw my hands into the air to gesture at everything that this is. Carl bends down to look under the dining room table, and then stands up right in front of me. What else do we have to go off on? Hey, I found something weird. 
We both look over at Raven, who holds up a corkscrew. Carl turns back to me, ignoring the husky. If we find it, that locked door will open, and we'll be able to get out. If he's here, why doesn't he just show up himself and do it for us? He said he's weak, that there are other forces in this house that have much more control than he does. He can only do so much. I gape at him. Do you hear yourself right now? Carl frowns and moves past me. What does this name even need to be cleared of? I feel tears starting to sting my eyes again because now I think I'm the only one who realises how crazy this all is. Don't you guys get what's actually going on here? Raven stops rustling through the drawers and looks up at me. You okay, Chase? No, because someone's fucking kidnapped us and put us in this crazy maze dungeon and we should be trying to figure out how we can get out. It's quiet for a moment as Raven and Cole exchange glances. It's okay, Chase. We're gonna get out of here. I lean my head back in despair, about to cover up my face with my hands when something catches my eye. In the chandelier, a small white envelope is wedged between the glass ornaments. I squint to make sure it's not my watering eyes creating an illusion. Yeah, there's definitely an envelope up there. Diamond patterns from the crystal cast across its surface. Guys? Carl ignores me as he continues to shuffle through things on the counter behind us. Carl, I found something. I point straight up at the chandelier above me. Carl stops then, finally, and moves next to me looking up. Is that a letter? Looks like it. Do you think? Is that what you're looking for? Carl gets up on the table, wobbling slightly as he reaches up to pull the envelope from the crystals. With a heavy thump, he drops back down to the floor. I'm still sceptical of everything right now, but as I get a closer look at the letter, I think I start to recognise it. That kinda looks like the same envelopes your mum collected? Carl picks up the envelope, turning it over. Kind of. Just says John on the front. Carl opens the flap to empty out the contents. Isn't that the guy that- Whoa! Whoa! The glass lights up! And what sounds like a match being struck accompanies the flash. Carl gasps and drops the letter shaking his hands. It's on fire? Shit, put it out! I stupidly wonder if the lights had somehow set the letter on fire as Carl starts trying to smother the letter with a sleeve. At that moment, a great moaning sound shakes the walls, almost knocking me off my feet and sending plates crashing to the floor. I cling to the table as the plates fall from the counter and the chandelier swings above us. The deep groaning coalesces into a scream that makes me clap my hands over my ears. Carl's staring at the ceiling with his eyes wide when we hear another hissing sound. I jerk my head to look back in time to see a gush of inky black smoke burst from the stove, another scream accompanying it. It rushes straight toward us, and just for a moment, I see the outline of what looks like a mouth and eyes in the smoke before it engulfs me. My senses are completely smothered. It feels like something is slamming up against my chest, and all the air is gone to be replaced by the unbreathable smoke. Its consistency is like water, filling my ears and eyes. I scream into the emptiness, but I can't hear myself over the cacophony of sounds like rushing water mixed with muffled screams and explosions. I fall to my knees, then curl up on the ground into a ball, just praying that the savage thing killing me would stop. Just as I'm starting to give in, something grabs the scruff of my neck hard and yanks me up so violently my teeth clack together. The fingers are unmistakably hooved. The letter, you fucking idiot! Then I'm shoved forward and find myself laying flat against the dining room table. Completely blind, I feel around before finding the letter. I clumsily rip the envelope part, grabbing the letter inside. Then, like a massive vacuum being turned on, the smoke is sucked out of the room, along with the horrible screaming and roaring. In an instant, the room is quiet again, and I slump back to the floor, gasping for breath. Carl's right next to me, curled up in the same position that I was. Raven's whimpering, his face in his hands, and his rear in the air. Carl coughs a few times, wheezing in air, before he looks up at me and the envelope clutched in my hands. The hell just happened? Are you okay? I can't respond. I lean back against one of the chairs tucked under the table for a moment, gathering my wits. Carl, yeah? If that James guy tells you anything else, just tell me and we'll do it. Carl breathes heavily in response. Raven, you okay? Raven sits a few feet in front of us, on his knees, tongue hanging out as he gasps. Good, good. You know, that's what I saw yesterday. Yeah, I gathered that. I give a short, humorless laugh. That... And also that I'm done asking questions, I just want to get out of here. After a few minutes of catching our breaths, 
I turn my attention back to the letter. Somehow it's completely undamaged despite catching on fire. It feels crisp and new and the ink almost looks fresh. It definitely looks like it came from one of the bins in the crawl space, but if that were the case then there's no way it could be in the great condition it's in. The letter itself is short and I start to read it aloud. My dearest John, the militia grows more agitated by the hour and I fear that they will demand a search of the mansion. If that does indeed occur, I will need everything in my utmost power to hold them off. I look over at Cole, wondering if he just wanted to read the letter instead, but he's looking right at me. They will never find the room I've left you in, do not fear. Cole moves closer to me, his hand reaching out to grab my shoulders. Uh, Cole? But if they so much as try to lay a finger on your head, it'll be the last thing they ever do. Before I can even move, Cole leans in and kisses me. I'm just able to get a glimpse of Raven's shocked face before I'm practically smothered by Cole's soft, warm nose and lips. I freeze, my shoulders tensing. It's not that I'm not enjoying it, it's just that the kiss was so unwarranted. I'm not sure how long it lasts, but I never make a move to stop it. When Cole does finally pull back, it's awkward and he's looking just as confused as I am. Raven sits there, openly staring at us. Cole lowers his ears, his nose growing pink. Uh, sorry. Uh, I don't know why, I just did that. I clear my throat. Don't worry about it. This place is doing weird things to me too. Ah, oh, that was cute. Raven, could you help me up, please? I mostly ask him so he won't dwell on what just happened. Cole clears his throat. Well, I, uh, I think the door's open now. Let's go check. We make our way slowly down the hall, Raven just behind us. I lean in closer to Cole's ear so the husky can't hear. So, was that really you, or did your great great whatever take control again? I don't know, I think I was still in control, just felt like the right thing to do, you know. It looked like you already knew what the letter said. Yeah. I wait for him to go on, but he doesn't. Well, what does he need his name cleared for anyway, being gay? I don't think people care about that stuff anymore. No, we already sort of knew that. Besides, that was basically a love letter. So, what is it that he thinks has ruined his legacy? Carl has a think. I guess the idea that he just allowed his lover to die? I think people believe that he sort of just left John to die, didn't really try to save him. Hmm. This whole mess seems like a pretty roundabout way to go about it, in my opinion. But like I said earlier, I'm done asking questions. Well, it was kind of nice. The kiss, I mean. Carl looks back at me with one green eye. Yeah? I smile a little. I guess the fact that something had been growing between us since the beginning of the week is pretty undeniable. And now we're here in this crazy alternate dimension with smoke monsters? Well, fuck it, I guess. I lean forward and kiss his big soft cheek. Yeah. Cole grins and is about to say something when I catch movement out of the corner of my eye. Immediately afterwards, I hear a dull thump and Cole grunts, his eyes bulging before he crumples, sending me to the floor with him. Oh my god. I yelp as my ankle bangs against the floor and I roll onto my back, teeth grit, straining to reach down to hold my foot. Whatever just hit us is standing over me now. I raise a hand feebly to hold off the next blow. When it doesn't come, I lower it slowly and look up. Jenna? Jenna stands there stoically, holding a what looks like a small wooden stool. Jen Jenna what? How did you get here? Jenna slowly sets the stool down, slowly seeming to recognise me. I lean forward to feel my ankle, the pain radiating from it in hot pulses. Chase, you okay? Happened to your leg? I sprained it. Hey, Jenna, been a while? I look over at Cole. He's still curled up on his side, his arms wrapped around himself. Cole, are you okay? Then to Jenna. Did you hit him? Jenna walks past Cole and crouches down next to my leg. This looks really bad. Yeah, Cole though, are you okay? Hmm... Carl grunts and turns over to face us, a hand to his chest. Jenna, the fuck was that? Jenna looks at my ankle a while longer before standing up and looking around. When it doesn't look like she's going to answer, Carl sits up. How did you find us here? Raven perks up. Yeah, is there a way out? Jenna finally looks down at Cole, and I note the complete lack of concern in her eyes. I came to your house looking for TJ and ended up going to the basement. She looks down the hall again. And I ended up here somehow. I blacked out before I did, so I don't know how to get out. Carl finally stands up, wearily eyeing the stool held loosely in Jenna's hand, 
before bending down to help me back up. Is your leg okay? He grunts into my ear as he slides my arm over his shoulder and slowly pulls me back up onto his back. Mostly. I think I kind of twisted it up again. Carl grunts again and turns back to Jenna, now with me on his back. Well, it's pretty fucked up just to blindly swing at someone round a corner. No, what's fucked up is waking up in a place you have no memory of going to. Jenna's sharp muzzle points right at Carl, glaring. Carl stutters for a second, clearly not expecting to have Jenna snap back at him. Hey, it's not my fault. We got no idea where we're at either. Why are you guys fighting? Raven looks innocently between the two of them, his ears perked. It's a good question, and I watch Jenna closely from over Carl's shoulder. She just clears at Carl, arms folded. Did she blame him for this somehow? After a few seconds of awkward silence, Carl speaks up. Well, you hit me for one, and I don't know why you're so mad at me. Jenna looks back at Cole, and I see the tenseness in her shoulders slowly loosen. I'm sorry, I'm just a little uptight after waking up here. Hey, you're taking it better than us. Chase was freaking out for hours. I give Raven a side glance. Well, things have been going crazy since you two left the lake. Like us ending up in this fucking nightmare dimension? Not just that. Jenna sets the stool down on the carpet before sticking out her forearm. And that's what I see the crusted blood in her fur in the form of three long lines. What the? TJ attacked me. What? That sentence doesn't seem to fit together. TJ attacked? Why? I've got no idea. The faraway vacant look Jenna had in her eyes earlier is fading to be replaced by a more concerned expression I better know her for. He's been losing it ever since Flynn tried to grab him at the lake. I start to feel a little sick to my stomach. Why? He wouldn't tell me. He was just acting anxious, kept looking over his shoulder. But isn't he sort of like that most of the time? Jenna folds her arms and shakes her head. No, he kept looking around, kept saying he was seeing things. She stops short. Like what? Jenna looks up. Sydney. We're quiet for a while. It seems all the rumours about this town are true. Everyone's crazy. This isn't normal at all, even for Echo. Jenna looks at Raven. Uh, I'm sorry, who are you? Raven grins. No, I'm sorry, I'm Raven. He sticks out a hand. Jenna looks at it before turning to me. Chase, something was going on with Leo too. He kept asking around for you. Then he ran off saying he had to take care of some things. Oh, I, I don't know why. I tried to think of what Leo might have wanted from me, but I draw a blank. Could be anything. Anyway, I've been trying to find TJ for ages. I don't even know what day it is anymore. Tried Carl's house since I'd run out of any other options. Jenna goes quiet, then reaches into her pockets and pulls out her phone, holding it up, clearly looking for a signal. Just as I got to your house, Carl, I heard a popping sound. Jenna sighs and puts her phone away again. Gunshots, I'm pretty sure. Coming from Main Street, something's been happening to everyone. Jenna slides her hands into her back pockets, looking around. And now this. Wow. So, something fucked up is happening all over town? I think about Leo and TJ and my stomach twists at the thought of them being out there. I can only hope that they were able to get out somehow. At this point, I'm just waiting to wake up. We all are. Yeah, especially after the giant smoke monster chased us around the dining room. What? Jenna looks at me and Carl. Carl glances back at me, as if asking me to be the one to explain the impossibility that had just happened. I take a breath, trying to think of how I'm going to say this. So, I just think at this point you're going to have to just, uh, just go with whatever this place throws at you, Jenna. Yeah, we've all just kind of accepted what's been happening. Well, we have to. Otherwise, it would just be us sitting around freaking out about how crazy this all is and not doing anything about it. And so far, it seems like we've at least been moving things forward. Jenna stares at us. What happened? Okay, we're going to fill her in. And then we're going to... Oh, there's a wooden door. So I guess we're going to open the door in the next episode. This is Usher signing off, and hopefully I will see you next time.